Hey, everybody. Okay, hello, hello, everybody. We will begin the next session with uh, Bureau Fold. Uh, the moderator is Eduardo Moreno, who you heard from earlier today. Uh, I should mention to our colleagues on Bureau Fold is that we have a, a nice audience here in person. Uh, I will rotate this camera so you can see, uh, but we also have a fantastic audience virtually. Uh, with that being said, uh, Eduardo, I will turn it over to you uh, to lead the, the next portion of this session. Please, Eduardo, go ahead. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, good morning again to all of you that are here. And of course, good morning to our colleagues uh, from Red Cross Town. And uh, uh, let me start by saying that uh, the pavilion aims to do three main things. One is knowledge, and this is the idea of a knowledge exchange hub, and the discussion will be centered around that. But it strongly connects, and I'm sure also Brent Cross has that, innovations, uh, for different forms of innovation, social, institutional, technological, and the third one, urban solutions. And uh, uh, I'm also sure your, your intervention will some form present what uh, kind of innovations and solutions you are presenting. For us, for the pavilion, it's critical that knowledge connects to, to policies, to actions. And we would like to hear from you, uh, what are these ingredients of success? There is a hand covering somewhere there. Uh, which are the ingredients of success and how your program uh, has contributed to this through uh, the flourishing index baseline uh, that you are going to present. And I'm going to introduce the first speaker, which is uh, Mr. Nick Stell. He's the joint manager partner Argent and partner related Argent. <clears throat> Nick joined Argent in 2007 and became joint manager partner in 2020 alongside Robert Evans. He's also one of the related Argent partners. He has spent more than 10 years working on King's Cross, where his main priority was leading the commercial team. Nick now jointly leads related Argent 10 million square feet Brent Cross town development in North London. And this is what we would like to hear about. He's an architect uh, and he's member of the RIBA for over 30 years. We are very honored, Nick, to have you here in this wonderful setting that you have. Uh, Nick, please, the floor is yours. Uh, I would appreciate if you can talk around seven minutes. Okay, thank you, Eduardo. Um, I will uh, do that. I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, I have got uh, colleagues who are going to uh, join and talk about specific parts of this. Um, so just, is that now sharing properly for everybody? Yes. So just to say who we are, I work for Related Argent and Argent uh, with the developers of King's Cross in London, that's what most people know Argent for, um, and our Related Argent uh, business is a, is a business that's set up with Related from New York, but it is a UK business. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what, relate, what Brent Cross Town is all about. Um, your Gita is then going to speak briefly about Barnet Council, the location where this is. And then we have Jamie and James who are going to talk specifically to the Flourishing Index, which is what um, we want to really explain uh, a bit more to you about. But I think you need to understand the context of the whole project first. So when we first got involved in 2015, we were, we were brought together uh, uh, to be a partner with Barnet Council. And that's really important part of what we're doing here. Um, these were the ambitions that the council had set for us uh, as we came uh, and joined them. Uh, they had a very, very clear idea in their own mind about what this huge development in their borough um, sh should be for, uh, and this sets it out. Um, it is a public-private partnership that we are involved in. It is a huge scheme of over 10 million square feet. Uh, and the fact that it is a public-private partnership actually helps us in terms of build this, building a true legacy for the council and for the city of London. It's very different from if they had just sold land to us. We are actually together in a joint economic partnership. So Brent Cross Town sits about 
uh, on, a, on a train journey about 12 minutes outside of central London. Uh, it's in northwest London. It's an area that historically hasn't had large scale commercial development previously. So what we're doing is quite unique in this part of London. Um, very, very importantly, there is a new railway station that is coming to, to the development. That's called Brent Cross West. This is the entrance that will be there that's already been constructed. Uh, and that will give you a 12 minute journey via this new brand new station straight into the center of town. These are the statistics for what the development is all about. You can see it's large scale. We're creating workspace of 25,000 people, almost 7,000 new homes. But it is so much more than statistics. Uh, the core values that underpin this are around social connectivity, environmental sustainability, and health and wellness. And I'm going to tell you a bit more about what that means and how we've set it out. So in putting this development forward, we have made four pledges. The first, that it will be the place in London for sport and play. Secondly, a town where all can flourish. Thirdly, a net zero carbon town. And fourthly, to drive greater connections. Um, and those are the four pledges that we really hang the whole development on. I'm going to start with the first one. And the reason that we have chosen this is this is our development. Um, and the main development area is to the, to, to the north. If you can see my cursor, it's the area to the top of this page is to the north of this green area. But this green space is part of our development area. And we have the opportunity to build new play and sports facilities on there. So we're building traditional sports facilities, challenger and social sports. The idea that we will bring people of all ages, all generations, all cultures together to enjoy those fields in a really, really practical uh, way where uh, we're, we're promoting female participation uh, at, at the forefront of that. The second area is around making a town where all can flourish. Now, that can be determined uh, a little bit of marketing spin if you want it to be. And that's why we have created the Flourishing Index, which is what my colleagues are going to speak to you in more detail about in a moment. But as the developer, the reason that we did this is we wanted to put science behind the word flourishing and to actually talk about the real measures we are taking and how we are actually using a development like this to improve people's lives. So that's something that Jamie and James will talk about. For us, at the, yes, the, the heart of it is creating a town centre that people actually want to come and visit and use on a regular basis. And that's, that's really what it's all about. We're, we're creating a new high street in London. Now, people often talk about the death of the high street in this country. I don't agree with that. But we've given ourselves the challenge of building a new one from scratch. And when we do that, we think about ground floor experience. We think about how people move. We think about how they feel. Think about what they, what they hear as well as what they see. And so one particularly unique aspect of what we're doing here on this giant development is we're putting in a music and sound strategy that thinks about the sounds that people hear, not just the things that people touch and the things that people see. Uh, and that takes many, many uh, different angles from both external and internal uh, with the buildings. Thirdly, we are focused on net zero carbon. Um, I think you know, that's a really important part of what we're all hopefully now doing as we, as we bring forward large developments like this. We know how much property adds to um, the carbon impact uh, on the globe. Um, our first area of uh, attack, if you like, in this is the embodied carbon. We're looking at actually what we're building our buildings out of. Um, and the area where we can make the most difference is across 3 million square feet uh, of office development, where we are looking to use timber in that construction as much as possible. We have all timber buildings, and then we have buildings that are combined uh, timber with, with other materials. Uh, we're also focused on operational energy. We are working with uh, one of Europe's most uh, foremost energy services companies, Vattenfall, who are owned by the Swedish government. Uh, we're creating a vast energy uh, centre and net heating and cooling network. We have the largest air-cooled uh, heat pump in Europe currently being constructed here on the site. So both embodied carbon and operational carbon, but also then looking at how do we actually facilitate low carbon lives for the people who live here. Um, 
that there's a whole presentation on that in its own, so I won't go into all the details. But fundamentally, we want to reduce uh, the, the, the number of uh, vehicle movements around the, build, around the development, particularly uh, private vehicles. So our target is that 80% of the, the, the journeys that take place at Brent Cross Town will be done either on foot, on bike, or on public transport. And we have to enable that and many other aspects in order to be successful. And finally, we want to uh, drive connections. And driving connectivity isn't just about trains and buses. It's about uh, community connections. It's about digital connections. Uh, and a really important part of it is actually connections beyond our boundaries. So at the moment, we have a development that's bounded by roads and railways. We need to create the safe connections across those so that people can move into and out of our development into the other communities safely, securely, and pleasantly. Uh, this just very, uh, just to give you a, a sense of it, this is where we are now on site. Uh, in the top right hand side, you can see those green playing fields. Right in front of you is the new railway station that's under construction. And then the area of the construction work, which is here, is the first phase uh, of buildings. They're mostly residential buildings with some office buildings down by the station. In the bottom left hand corner, you'll see a new park. This is the new park, which we have already built and opened ahead of the buildings to make sure that people understand what that direction of travel is in terms of the quality of the environment that we are trying to create. We have built um, a mass timber pavilion. This is the pavilion where we visitors come, where we uh, have marketing material, but also we do a lot of community events. So again, we are showcasing what is possible um, from low carbon construction perspective. And finally, I just wanted to finish on uh, this rather beautiful object. Uh, we're bringing um, a, a, a cultural identity to this place as well. Um, this is actually an electrical substation that we opened about three months ago. And rather than building a nasty grey box around it, we've built a beautiful piece of public art, which sits the, at the bottom of the main motorway that comes from Northern England into London. So this is basically the moment you enter central London now. You see this, it's 51 metres long, 21 metres high. And it, and it talks about the cultural as well as the social identity that we're trying to create. So I'm going to stop now. That's a very, very fast summary of a very large, complex project that we're undertaking. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing it. And Yogita, I think you'd like to talk a little bit just about Barnett's ambitions here. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Nick. I think Jamie's going to share the screen for me. Yeah. Yeah, you get so one second. Um, Brilliant, thanks, Jamie. Can you see well, that? Okay. Perfect. Before you start, before you start, uh, Yogita, let me please introduce you. Sorry, Eduardo. Yes, please do. It's important for the people that are hearing you to know uh, what you are doing. Uh, Yogita Popat is the assistant director for sustainability at Barnet Council. Uh, she, she, well, Barnet Council is the second largest borough in London for all of us to know. She's very experienced senior manager with over 16 years of professional experience in research and data and trying to connect all these to decision making. She's responsible for delivering the council ambitions, particularly with the net zero council that uh, Nick was referring to. And uh, this should happen in 2030, but not later than 2042. Uh, Obviously, for that to happen, and I think uh, Yogita is going to explain this to us, the involvement of communities, resident, business is at the heart of their plans. Uh, we would like to hear more from Bar Barnett Zero, please. The floor is yours, Yogita. Thank you, Eduardo. So yes, I'm Yogita. I'm the Assistant Director for Sustainability at Barnett. I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes talking through what our journey looks like and a bit about the borough. And so that really puts the context of our partnership into, um, it puts our partnership into context. So Jamie, can I just ask you to um, share the next slide, please? Okay, so our borough, we've got a wonderful place to live and to work in, but we have massive ambitions to make it even better. Um, we've got a new vision for Barnet, one that puts caring for our people, our places and the planet at the heart of everything it, everything we do. So that really, really holds and resonates um, to what Nick was talking about and how the Brent Cross Town and the Flourishing Index really links to the work we're doing. So let me tell you a bit about Barnet. 
Barnet is situated in the north of London. It is the second largest borough in terms of population and size. So we have over 380,000 residents that live in our borough, which is 155 individual households. We have 26,000 businesses that are there and each of those business, or well, the majority of those businesses, I think it's about 96% of those businesses are small or medium. So they're very like small businesses and micro businesses with less than five people um, employed. And we have over a thousand charities. So where Nick was talking about the community and bringing them together, there's about a thousand of those. And our new corporate plan is very much looking at how we engage effectively with those communities and making sure residents are at the heart of everything we do. A third of our borough is covered by parks and green spaces, making it really um, challenging to put in some infrastructure, but also great opportunities in terms of our biodiversity and green spaces. We have an eclectic population with 25% of our population who are under 19. So giving us real opportunities to change um, our outset for generations to come. But we've also got um, a very high population of over 75, making our care population quite difficult and, and challenging. In terms of our space, because of the size of our borough, we produce almost 1.76 million tonnes of carbon every single year from the energy, just from homes and transport. So huge challenges. We've set ourselves, Jamie, next slide, please. We've set ourselves a, a wonderful target to become one of London's most sustainable boroughs. And the reason we've decided to become one of London's most sustainable boroughs is that we recognise that we can't do it alone. So the partnerships we have in terms of Brent Cross Town, as well as the other, um, other local authorities, means that we're all kind of going towards the same um, commitments. We've got a commitment to become a net zero council by 2030. So that means our own operations and our procurement and all the work that we do inside our own council buildings. But as a borough, we have a target to become net zero as soon as possible after 2030, but no later than 2042. A target that was brought forward by eight years in the last 12 months um, when we declared a climate and biodiversity emergency. So how are we going to do that? Jamie, next slide. Um, we're going to be looking at our housings and buildings. So the 15,000 houses that Barnet Council has direct influence, we've developed a pathway to getting that to net zero. But we also have 140,000 households that we have to support and enable to get there. Transport is a big one for Barnet. So Brent Cross Town and, and the new train station that's been developed there is a a way to get our transport journeys to net zero and also the active travel within the borough and how do we support that. The infrastructure in Barnet means that getting from north to south is really easy but east to west is really hard. Our ambitions around renewable en energy and the work we've got with Battenfall really plays into that but we're looking at how we can make that bigger. Waste is a big one. So sustainable com consumption, not only in the waste that we produce, but the things we buy and the food we eat. Business and skills, we've talked about that. We've got 26,000 businesses. And whilst that's a challenge about supporting those small businesses, it gives us huge opportunities about getting the right businesses into our boroughs and partnering with local universities to do that. And then the natural environment. If a third of our borough is green spaces, how do we use that natural environment to support our ambitions around biodiversity and green spaces? And then our partnerships. So the work we're doing with Nick and Jamie on the Flourishing Index really helps us to achieve what's coming out our Residence Perception Survey and our Joint Strategic Needs Assessments. So really putting the social and economic um, sustainability goals at the heart of what we do, as well as our environment. Um, that is a whistle-stop tour, and I know Jamie's going to start talking about the Flourishing Index. On the next slide is a link to our website, um, and also um, if you'd like to get in touch for more details. But I'm going to let Jamie talk about Flourishing and how that really links to our goals in terms of becoming a net zero borough. Thank you very much, Jogita. Uh, um, we can see here in, in this presentation two things that I would like before giving the floor to Jamie. Please, Jamie, uh, one minute. I think we are doing well with time because there are two questions that are interesting that I would like to refer to you uh, and Nick. 
what, what I can see in this presentation is, is a very thoughtful idea of looking inside the, the neighborhood of the town to the playing fields, to the inclusive community, to the design of the spaces, but at the same time, looking outside the community and the town to the connection and to the net zero carbon, which is both internal and external, and the use of technology, but also of design. A question from uh, the Secretary General of Urban Economy Forum. I think it was to Nick, but any of you can, can respond. If you can tell us the building materials, to which percentage they contribute to, to uh, CO2 emissions uh, reduction. And also from Gustav, uh, how, although you, to some extent, uh, Yogita, you presented this with the different sectors that you interact, how you contribute to net zero lifestyle? Lifestyle. So uh, one minute maximum each, uh, Nick and then Yogita in that order. Thank you. Nick, you well, want to go first? I don't have specific, I, what, the question was around what are the percentages of materials? No, which is the percentage that uh, you were speaking, the building materials, the use of wood and timber, et cetera. Uh, if the, the net carbon reduction, which percentage account this kind of technology solutions? Okay, so I, uh, I'm not an engineer, so I'm not gonna give you a, a technical answer to that. We are working at the moment where we are trying to get from a steady state CO2 per meter cube of about 800 um, uh, to down to about 350, 400. So we are trying to reduce by about 50% across all of our office buildings. And, and in some cases where we can use all timber, which is generally on the smaller buildings, um, we can we can do do better than that. And where we're having to do hybrid buildings, where we're combining with uh, with tim with, with with concrete and steel, uh, then clearly it's not as good as that. In terms of concrete, we are actually we because of the scale of the development, we have put our own batching plant onto the, the onto the estate, so we can create concrete on on the estate. Um, and reduce the embedded carbon in that through the, the redu reduced um, uh, vehicle movements. So it's it's just we're, we're working as hard as we can to use as much of the, of the low carbon material, i.e. timber, as we can. Thank you very much. It's not, it's not statistical answer. Eduardo, remind me of the question around communities and residents. Yes, the question is more uh, on uh, how lifestyle for net zero is achieved. Okay, so we're very much early on our journey for that. We've just launched a citizens assembly where we're working with residents across the borough to identify how we can become more sustainable together now and in the future. And we're very much near the end of that. We've probably got another month or so while the citizens of Barnet, who are a representative of the demographics across the borough, are helping us design that. Um, our Barnet Zero campaign is a campaign by the community, for the community, recognising that we need to do this together. So that's really about embedding sustainability in everything we do. And then the other bit that will probably answer the question in the chat um, is around how we look at behaviours and um, attitudes to sustainability and make sure we're making decisions that are equitable for everyone. So we're working with a local university to really understand what some of those barriers to sustainability might be and how we can become a net zero society. And that work is beginning and we're just waiting for the findings of that. So we'd be happy to come back next year and show you and talk to you about some of that work but very much on the early days of developing where we are on that journey about bringing residents with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yogita. I like a lot the word journey. That's exactly the, the only way transformative action of such important things like the environment, the cities can be achieved. Uh, Jamie, sorry that I knew, I knew it was your turn, but I knew also that your presentation around this important index on flourishing is going to move us a little bit to another direction. Uh, and I wanted to, to give a space to this question that were 
related to more to the presentation. Apologies for that. Jamie Anderson uh, is a research fellow, University of Manchester and Urban Wellbeing Lead of Bureau Hapol. Jim Anderson works with this university and the Urban Institute in, in the Urban Wellbeing Service Offer. He has, although he looks very young, he has over 16 years professional experience in research and practice and creating and using a strong urban well-being evidence. To tell you that in the World Urban Pavilion, the flourishing index, and of course the two presentations are extremely important for us to learn from you and to envision the possibility in the future of working together in many countries around the world. Uh, Jamie, the floor is yours and please tell us more about this index, his applicability and uh, his rationale. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eduardo. Can you hear me okay? Just check in. Perfect. perfect. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. And so I'm going to speak for probably 10, 12 minutes, and, I, and I'm going to talk through what we mean by flourishing and our approach to measuring uh, that interpretation of flourishing at Brent Cross Town. Then I'm going to give a handful of examples from our baseline um, flourishing index findings report. Then then I'm going to hand over to James, uh, from also from Manchester University, um, which doesn't work at Bureau Halfold, um, it's just, just me representing Bureau Halfold. He's going to wrap up with uh, five, 10 minutes, kind of ref reflecting back, uh, summarizing and reflecting on, you know, what this means in terms of local context, but also thinking more widely um, in terms of um, international context and, and general context. Um, so. So next slide, one second. So what, what do we mean by flourishing? So, so for us, this this is um this is about measuring flourishing in the in the literal sense. So, so it's it's about understanding how individuals and communities how they're feeling and how they're functioning in their own in their own words. You know, uh, uh, from their own perspective, feeling really good. So positive emotions and positive functioning. You know, life feeling like it's going well for people um, and the, these having a combination of this you know these good feelings and positive functioning is, is very strongly associated with improved productivity uh, creativity um, brain function immune function tolerance of others lo lots of utilitarian be benefits but also just good just like what people most individuals um, uh, and people, most people and groups that really value and they, you know, as for themselves and for, and for others, um, and so, unfortunately, most of us are in the middle of this bell curve where we're actually, you know, doing just okay or just average mental health, and then some of us, too many of us, um, we're hovering down here in the disorders uh, end of the spectrum, especially when in terms of uh, general disorders such as anxiety and depression. So. If that's what flourishing is, then how, how are we going about measuring it and creating this index? So I like to borrow the, this quote from Sir Gus O'Donnell, who says, you know, this is about if you treasure something, measure it. Um, and so that's, a, that's precisely what we're trying to do is, is combine measures of literal flourishing, what I was just talking about, which is self-reported experience, but using like validated and strong measures, both survey measures and interview techniques. And then also measuring proxy flourishing. So this isn't flourishing in the literal sense. This is like step, taking a step back and saying, what are the key causes of, of flourishing? And I'm, I'm not going to go through all the factors listed here, just to say that we're, you know, we're trying to push beyond what would normally, it was typically or traditionally measured if, you know, in regards to well-being as proxies like productivity or GDP uh, instead putting more emphasis or greater emphasis on things like job satisfaction and uh, they go further. So in terms of our approach, um, I've already said um, or set out how what we're trying to do is, 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 is moving things on by measuring systematically people's experiences, um, which is you know, a big, really big thing in itself. But then I'm also going to do, talk about three, three ways in which uh, our approach um, has or the three other key aspects to it, basically two key components. First of all, first of all, um, we're working collaboratively, so working, you know, not just to co-produce a flourishing index, 
but also uh, collect the data associated with, associated with that index. Uh, so working with Yugita uh, and, and colleagues in government, so in public health as well and, and in comms, working with Nick and colleagues at, at um, Argent and, and in industry, so social value managers, asset managers, but also really very importantly, working with the community and um, really very conscious that this is, you know, this is quite a complex and new, nuanced topic, making sure that this isn't a technocratic exercise, you know, a top down thing. This is really very much about understanding what well-being means in, in, the, in people's own words, you know, in the, in the community and tempering that kind of grassroots democratic voice with, with more of a, you know, a, um, a technocratic or more of a top down um, approach. And then, and also working in, with acad academics. So at University of Manchester, we have an interdisciplinary team of statisticians, psychologists, health economists, but also uh, drawing on the input of uh, other academics institutions as well um, from around the world. So the other key thing we're doing in terms of approach is, is using a mixed methods um, approach. So this is actually five different types of, of data collection, five modes. Um, first of all, used drawing on routinely collected data. So in the UK, we're really quite fortunate and it's well placed because we have quite comprehensive national surveys of, of well-being in, in the literal sense, but also key proxies. They're not always used very well. But we have them, and we're stuck. We're using them, and these can have anywhere between fifteen thousand and a hundred thousand people in each wave of data collection, and that allows us to compare Brent Cross to national trends and and regional trends. Um, and then, also because the, the 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 national data doesn't allow you to drill down to specific localities very well, it can it can, but not always that convincingly. Uh, we're also collecting bespoke local data, so. This is the bulk of our data collection and this is as i said before it was um working with the community doing interviews both individual and group interviews it's been doing lots of surveys so uh 1500 surveys um and that's a combination of intercept so grab literally grabbing people in the street in public spaces but but also sharing the survey online and um, we do direct behavior observation and we have something like 200,000 uh, data points in the baseline and that's a combination of manual tools and automated. So manually, we we'll, we literally will go to a space and count and code the, the number of people being physically active or connecting with others or being mindful of their environment. And we also have uh, sensors that um, are on lampposts that that can collect the you know the, the but more the physical activity behaviors like cycling and and walking. And then very important, importantly for the commun local community, uh, we were asked to collect um, air pollution data at a local primary school. Um, and we were asked, uh, we, we did that using proper calibrated, you know, um, uh, scientifically valid uh, tools. So last, last, last point on the on approach, the, the key thing that we're trying to, what we are doing here is, is gathering before and after data. So as, as Nick alluded to before, uh, showed us before, you know, the bank cross is on the ground, it's being delivered right now, but it was really important to get before uh, baseline data set and then come back after repeatedly to collect data after, you know, or as as the interventions rolled out. And um, so this is this is especially trying to go beyond post occupancy evaluation. Uh, POE is, of course, a really important tool, but we're trying to go even beyond beyond that and to demonstrate causality and additionality and, and, and use controls or comparison groups um, wherever possible. So just to, to wrap up, so I'm going to get into the last uh, kind of few minutes and um, I just wanted to provide a few examples of, of some findings from, from the baseline work. And um, I was wanted to start by just offering an overview, which is that um, the baseline report, which we'll be, we'll be, able, we'll be sharing uh, soon um, in its entirety, but it is very much a mixed lot of findings. Um, so on the one hand, negative baseline insights and things that can be turned around, and, you know, priorities for, for lifting things. Um, so, uh, you know, for, lo for local well-being, for example, job satisfaction, which I'll come back to, then, but also positive. So uh, there, there are things that are really good about this locality and the community and where they're at. So um, things to protect and build upon. For example, um, a, a strong sense of belonging in the area. 
but before I, I, I go into that, I just want to I want to show this this map um, to and talk a little bit about um, the people who did the, conduct the, who were part of the survey. So uh, this well, you know, it's fifteen hundred people, and the vast vast majority they either live within the development boundaries, the orange line, or or within a ten minutes kind of cycling distance of the proposed new high street. Um, bigger circles basically represent more people in that postcode or that location. Um, so we, we managed to get a good representation spatially um, of, of the area, but also we, we worked, hard, worked hard to get a good demographic representation. So we, we worked hard to make sure that the people who did this survey were the right mix, of the, you know, a representative mix of different eth the right, um, local ethnicities, ages, uh, religious backgrounds, etc. So just a couple of slides on, on a couple of examples of findings. So positive, first of all, this is um, people's reported belonging. So how, how, how much they feel they belong to the, the local community. And this was really very, very positive and strong. So, you know, almost 37% of people felt they very, uh, very, they a very strong sense of belonging, almost double that that we see in England, um, both generally in England and, and a matched group as well. Um, so really positive. Positive and something to, to you know, to to protect going forward. I think it could partly have been affected by COVID. Um, I think COVID potentially did bring this community and other communities together, and therefore it may have impacted. But generally, this is something really, you know, really important to leverage as a resource, but also look out for and protect as lots of you know thousands of new people come to the area, and the communities have, have said you know said to us that, that this is really very important to them. Uh, they want to maintain that sense of belonging. I think um, Barnett and Argent are already starting to do that by working with local artists and harnessing a sense of belonging, local identity, et cetera. But um, really, really interesting journey, as you say, Eduardo, um, a good word to use. So um, another positive finding really quickly, social support. This was, uh, this was on a scale of zero to five. This was um, found to be above national average. Um, and really encouraging to hear of, uh, and uh, again, really important to protect and, and embrace uh, with local community groups, such as in this picture, a group called um, the Yard Group, I think. Um, uh, anyway, um, quickly onto a couple of negative findings. So um, this is job satisfaction. And as you can see, it's quite considerably lower than the national average and, um, it's it's on a scale of zero to seven, so there's lots of room for improvement on, for everyone, uh, and a great again a great opportunity in the context of, of Brent Cross, where there's you know twenty thousand or more new jobs coming. Uh, how do we ensure that that not only creating new jobs, but high quality jobs that shift shift the dial on on job satisfaction, um, and then last um, we just got this one, which this this observation this insight is not from the survey; it's actually from the observed behavior uh, data that we collected and uh, we saw that basically there's a lower proportion of women and girls using the the playing fields that nick mentioned earlier um and um this you know it's, it was anywhere between depending on the site it was anywhere between five and ten percent and this again it's something that um that Arjun and, and barnet and partners want to address they i think they already are doing with a local girls football team and nightingales and, and other things and and it's something to you know work with the community on going forwards to address to, to get this to be more balanced so um i'm going to hand over now to james um, and stop sharing my slides because i don't think you you know you don't have slides do you james i do not jamie one second okay uh, jamie it's a wonderful presentation i really like it I mean, uh, I, it's important because you are creating this before, after, and controlling the groups and trying to see both space-related behavior activities, how are affecting in this flourishing. There are some questions. We will keep them uh, uh, for the end. And I would like that uh, James Evans, who is also a professor at the University of Manchester uh, in Human Geography, director of the Manchester Urban Institute, and his work explores the geographical aspect of smart cities and urban sustainability. Uh, we are really interested, uh, James, to hear how space, uh, geography, 
uh, urban uh, cities interact in terms of uh, this notion of smartness. So please go ahead. You have seven minutes, Max. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to, to speak to a, an international audience. It's an honor to be here. Um, my work focuses on how cities can transform to address sustainability goals using smart technology, new approaches, new forms of evidence. Uh, and it's been a pleasure to be involved with this project with uh, an extremely forward looking uh, municipality and an extremely forward looking uh, corporate partner. Uh, remind ourselves of the global context for this uh, and maybe pose some, some questions if you like. Uh, that will hopefully generate uh, some reactions from, from the audience around whether this is relevant and how, how it might uh, be rolled out more widely. Uh, so the first point I'd like to make, clearly we need more fine-grained understandings of how urban development shapes human outcomes. Um, cities remain the places where most people live, and because they're dense, uh, they're the places that it's most effective to make, to make a beneficial difference to people's lives. And Brent Cross is really an attempt to do this, bringing together energy, mobility, employment, quality of life, uh, to try and transform a place, but also people's lives. The challenge of course here is evaluation of urban development is surprisingly rare. Um, if you work in the public policy sector, the evaluation of public policies is completely standard. Uh, but it's remarkably rare in terms of evaluating the impacts of urban developments. So, for example, um, we've been undertaking large scale urban regeneration across the global north for about 30 years. Uh, yet there's not much of a robust evidence base about its impacts on the lives and livelihoods of residents. Uh, and this is a big oversight. Uh, the United Nations SDG 17 focuses on the need for better data, um, more progressive measurements of how we improve people's lives. Uh, and I think that's where flourishing might come in. Um, and the UN Habitat's most recent cities report, and Eduardo, you'll know this much better than me, uh, on urban health, talks about the need for more disaggregated data collection, uh, the need for joined up approaches that can capture climate and health co-benefits, and of course, the need for holistic place-based approaches. Um, so I think this is why we're quite excited uh, about the idea of flourishing. But as Jamie has given you some idea, it's not straightforward when you find an evidence gap in the literature, there's always a potential explanation that the evidence gap exists because it's really hard uh, to collect robust evidence on a particular problem. Uh, funding for evaluation is scarce. Uh, baselines are required, so this requires this approach requires some upstream thinking. Uh, it really needs to be factored in at the design stage. The kinds of outcomes we're interested in: health, well-being, uh, employability outcomes. Their long-term, long-term funding is hard to guarantee. Uh, cities are complex, multivariate environments. It's hard to identify causality. Um, cohort studies are tricky because people move around the built environment is only one driver of their outcomes so we need more bespoke data we need more innovative involved methodologies um, and of course the precise nature of the challenge varies between different international contexts and we more and more realize that urban innovations need to be articulated into different places uh, and reflect uh, the specific characteristics of those places and needs to work. And I think that's one of the strengths of the flourishing index that it's co-produced with communities. So it does reflect the needs of specific people in specific places. So finally, uh, I think there's a big prize to be had here, understanding uh, how urban development can improve health, well-being, uh, outcomes, offers a huge potential way to make people's lives better. Cities are being developed, built, regenerated uh, en masse uh, every single day uh, of the year. Another useful trend is more and more groups are interested in evidence about what works. Companies want to understand 
uh, the success of their developments. Municipal governments want ways to align urban development with their policy goals. Communities want evidence to enable them to push for better developments. Uh, and investors want ways to unlock ESG funding for urban development. So some challenges for us, we need some way to unlock longer term funding, longer term partnerships working across private, public and academic sectors. Uh, and we need to figure out ways to streamline that data collection uh, co-production process uh, if we're going to scale up these kinds of approaches. And clearly digital technology has a potentially transformative role there. And the final thing, of course, is we need more examples of how this might work in different international settings. Would this have traction uh, in many of the other places across the world? I'll leave it there. Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, I really like it because your analysis is, is confronting the index to the reality of the data, the space, the connection to policies. It, I, I really appreciate I had been working a lot in this topic. I might have some questions, but uh, it's not my turn to ask questions. I, there are some from the chat, but Alex, uh, maybe you would like to see if among those that are attending here, there are some questions they would like to ask directly to, to the four speakers or the last two, as, uh, I don't know. Uh, Alex, could you, could you coordinate that? Or would you allow me to ask the question from the chat? Thank you, Eduardo. I, I think you can hear me, yes, Eduardo? Yes, yes, perfect. Fantastic. So I, I do want to the audience, does anybody have any questions? I do have a question. Please. Uh, um, I don't have some of my questions. Thank you so much. Uh, my question is uh, regarding uh, technologies. Uh, we are incorporating into the smart cities and the development that we are doing. How we really make sure these technologies are keeping the compatibility and going forward because the, the process is very slow. Um, uh, it takes years, five years, 10 years, or even more to really get to. Um, digitization and in incorporating all of the structure of a digital city. Um, how you assure uh, technology you're incorporating today is gonna work for you in future? Um, just a very, in a, in a nutshell question. Thank you, thank you. This is a very clever question. We might get one or two more from the audience. Alex? I don't know if you heard the question because at the beginning he was not connected to the micro. But in the nutshell, it's, it's uh, if technology can contribute, accelerate data collection, information treatment, in the sense of uh, having better possibilities of the flourishing index to connect to, to technological development, as I understood from my side. Uh, uh, Alex? Uh, yep, yeah, there's another question. Uh, please uh, come to the stand, though, yes. It might be a question or a comment. Living here in Regent Park as a TCAC tenant, I joined into the committee of the UN Pavilion. It's wonderful that they have come to this community, but there's still a lot of uh, challenges and, and a lot of work to do. The changes in Regent Park as a TCAC tenant, we always had that stigma that we don't work or we don't, uh, we can advocate for ourselves. Now having private owners is still that they listen to them more than listening to us as a, as a TCAC tenants. So that needs to be more of, of a work that our voice as a TCAC tenants count that somebody else should not be translating for me or speaking for me. So this is a challenge. It's great, this new changes in the community in Regent Park, but there's still a lot of work to do as a TCAC tenants that like I said before, our voices does count. It's not, not to listen to the other of a private owner, it's to be listened as to us as a TCAT tenant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting, clever question. And it's true that in the last year, it has been an important trend towards 
integrating the view, the preference, the, the sentiment, desires of people as part of development outcomes. So we would like to hear from you on that. Is Alex anyone else, or can I add one or two from the chat? There's one more question, uh, Eduardo, and then I think we'll we'll set it there and, and um, we can have the responses. Okay. okay. Um, so, you know, housing multitudes, as well as what you've spoken about today, is of course a project that will acquire a lot of long-term funding. And that of course speaks to the previous, um, you know, speaker's conversation about equity and ownership. So realistically speaking, um, what sort of funding models are you thinking of in terms of funding all these pieces? And when it comes to funding as well, not just the infrastructure, but also, you know, how do equity and jobs and ownership fit into all of that? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, please, uh, any of you take the responses. We have a time constraint. Try to be very, very uh, focused to the point. And I would like to add one or two from the chat. One, which seems to me interesting, is flourishing the same or similar to well-being. Uh, it's a synonym. Flourishing, I see more like a process-oriented, well-being a state of something. But uh, I would like to hear from you. My colleague Daifet from UN Habitat is saying if uh, flourishing development as you will be implementing policies may have an impact in terms of uh, housing prices, affordability, et cetera. Uh, uh, as you, we know, some of these interventions have always uh, this caveat that there need to be control in terms of keeping local populations. So please, the floor is yours, whoever would like to respond. Uh, thank you, Eduardo. C could, could I start just... Um, yes, I, 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 I will start by talking to the last question, if I may, around gentrification, and also pick up the voice of the community in that. Now, I think I'll let the others uh, carry on from that. We, we are always asked a question about gentrification. What I can tell you is that our ambition as a developer who is in this project we will be here for 15 to 20 years. Um, working on this. So our intention is to stay for the long term. And our intention is to reach out beyond the boundaries of our development and lift up a much wider uh, community of people in the borough than just the people who are going to come and live and work there. There is, the question is quite specific about the, the, the rising uh, house prices and rental prices. And that is a challenge across the whole of London. Uh, for us, we, I go back to the answer, the, 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 thing I'm, the point I made at the beginning about public-private partnership. We as a private developer cannot solve that problem on our own. We need to build new homes in London because there are, we have a housing crisis. In the process of building new homes, we want to make them pleasant. We want to make the environment that they are in uh, around which, uh, uh, where they're situated pleasant. If, there is inevitability that that process leads to a ripple effect on values. We have to then work with the council. We have to work with the Greater London Authority, the GLA here, the sort of the, the citywide um, authority, and ensure that we are providing uh, appropriate affordable housing within what we're doing, but also that there is a broader delivery um, across, across the whole of the city that addresses that issue. I don't think that it, it can sit within, within the private sector alone. So we are replacing one of the first things, the very first building we are, are building in the whole development is replacing homes uh, that exist on the site. So there's over uh, 100 homes that are the very first thing that we deliver. The other first things that we are delivering are public spaces, their parks, their new shops, their new facilities for an audience before any of our new residents have even arrived. So we're starting from that point. And then I'll just want to link it to the community and to the Flourishing Index because the whole point of the Flourishing Index is that we create feedback loops over time, over 15 or 20 years. So everything that we hear, everything that we learn, for good or for bad, we feed back into this process and we can learn from it and improve what we do. The council can learn from it and improve what they do. 
and then we can start to share that information on a London-wide basis. We can start to make broader civic improvements across the whole city. So it's not a simple answer. It's a very, very complex answer. And, and the community that live there, I 100% agree with the lady who spoke that we have to have a voice and have to be listened to. Because quite often, the voice from that local person actually brings a truth that as developers and even as a local authority, we sometimes struggle to see. So it, it's really important that we have that voice in the book. Thank you, Nick. Uh, we have the time in front of us, but uh, I would like just to say that uh, I'm very glad that you responded to this question. Uh, one Eduardo, of our still... Eduardo yes. could I just come in on the back of Nick's comment, because it really does speak to what Nick was saying. So one go of ahead, the things that Nick hasn't spoken about is that some of the people that are actually buying and um, opening businesses in our Brent Cross town at the moment are people from the community. And it's wonderful to see that we've got local people from the community buying the spaces in the town or sort of developing. So, so Nick hasn't sort of mentioned that and it's great to see and it's through the work that we're doing with Related Argent. The other thing to note is that in terms of our wider development in Barnet, we are committed to building a thousand affordable homes as part of our growth strategy and partnerships like Nick's talking about are key to the delivery of this. So very much sort of working and hearing the other thing, sort of talking to the comment that the lovely lady made just now about hearing residents' voices, our Citizens Assembly does that. So we've got 40 participants from across the borough who are very much part of our demographics. They come from all ages and ethnicities and their private owners, their tenants, etc. I mean, the fact that our demographics has a 90-year-old who comes to every single assembly session to give us his views really talks to the breadth of people we're listening to. We want to be a council that is effective and engaged. So every part of our development strategy has that in it. Um, just making sure that we're listening to everybody in the space, not just some voices. Thank you, very important response. To tell you that one of our steering members committees of the pavilion is from this community. And she was very concerned that uh, you could address this question. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm sure she, she's happy to hear that uh, this is part of your concerns. I want uh, on behalf of the World Urban Pavilion to, to say big, big thank you to four of you. Mm -hmm. Each one of you really contributed to give a very good perspective of the work that you are doing. And as I mentioned before, we would like to explore in the future the possibility in many parts of the world of doing some uh, work together. Thank you very much. Thank you to the audience. Thank you to the people who ask questions in the chat. And uh, Alex, we will 